All right. Well, good morning and thank you all so much for coming to the Special Collections and University Archives very first roadshow. Um, we are very excited to have you here and we really appreciate you taking your time to visit with us this morning and we think you'll have a good time seeing what we think is special about Special Collections and University Archives. Um, as Sandy said, my name is Cherry Williams and I am the Director of Distinctive Collections and that just happens to be UCR's term for Special Collections and University Archives. Um, so let me just go over the agenda a little bit with you today. Um, we're going to start with an overview of our collections and we work together as a collaborative team and everybody overlaps, but we have also specific responsibilities among the librarians and Karen uh, for specific parts of the collection. Um, Karen is going to, Karen runs our reading room and so she's going to specifically give you some help on how to actually access the collection so that you'll feel comfortable using them both online as well as when we're able to welcome you back and, and have you have hands on with them. And then we want to share some of our favorite things. So we have lots of treats and I never knew you had that and who knew kinds of things as well as just things to delight. And Sandy has arranged that we'll have plenty of time for your questions at the end, but please feel free to interrupt and um, we're happy to answer your questions as we go. So let me turn this over now to Sandy, uh, our Public Services Outreach Librarian. Thank you, Cherry. Um, so welcome everybody again. And I'd like to start us off by talking about our statement of solidarity. So as I'm sure everyone knows, we are living in incredibly unprecedented and difficult times right now. And as members of the UCR community, we do stand with Black Lives Matters against racial injustice, police brutality, and other human rights violations. We also wanna recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kowea, the Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples, as well as their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Though we now meet in digital spaces, we do invite you to learn whose ancestral lands you're located on on the following link, nativeland.ca. So we'll just start off with a few brief introductions. Um, as Jerry mentioned, my name is Sandy Enriquez and my official title is Special Collections Public Services Outreach and Community Engagement Librarian. And I'm Karen Raines, the Special Collections Public Services Coordinator. Hello, I'm Andrew Lippert. I'm the Special Collections Processing Archivist. My name is Andrea Hoff, and I'm the University Archivist. Hi, my name is Jessica Geyser, and I'm the Collections Management Librarian. And so now I'll pass it off to Andrew to start our first uh, collection overview about the Ian Collection of Science Fiction and Fantasy. And Andrew, just let me know next slide whenever you're ready. Yep, uh, go ahead. All right, so we'll start off with the Eaton Collection, uh, which began with the donation of Dr. J. Lloyd Eaton's personal library of uh, 7,500 books, and that's a, a portrait of him right there in the top left. Um, he made his donation in 1969, at a time when science fiction and fantasy were still seen as a genre for young boys and not considered suitable for scholarly work. Despite this, Donald Wilson, who was a university librarian at the time, saw the future value of having such a collection and brought it to UCR. A decade later, in 1979, Professor George Slusser, who was in the Comparative Literature Department, became the first curator of the Eaton Collection, and it was under his guidance that the collection first began to grow and became a fo focus of scholarly inquiry. Today, the Eaton is home to over 200,000 cataloged items, and 1,700 linear feet of manuscript materials. Go ahead and slide. So we'll start here on the top left and we'll go clockwise. Um, so these are a few of the strengths of the Eaton Collection. Um, this is not exhaustive, but it gives you an idea of some of the things we have. So in the top left, uh, starting with author's papers, uh, despite the collection starting with J. Lloyd Eaton's uh, donation of books, the collection has grown to include a number of author's papers. And right now we are up to 36 collections. Uh, in this 
picture here on the top left, uh, you have Ben Bova on the left and Anne McCaffrey on the right seated. Um, that picture was taken at Worldcon in 1969, and we have both of their collections included in that number of 36 total authors' papers. Uh, moving to the top right, the Eaton collection is uh, has long been one of the strongest collections in the country in fandom materials, from convention photographs, like the picture on the top left, to fanzines and art. Uh, this image here on the top right is of Roscoe, who is a god from the Fanish pantheon, um, along with Fu and Gu, so there are three of them. Uh, and this was uh, fans doing fan things back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and that's a, a wonderful piece of stained glass that we, that we have uh, in our collections. Um, moving down to the bottom right, so the, the collection started uh, with Dr. Taylor Eaton's uh, book collection, and it has continued to grow uh, both in books and other print materials. And as I said before, there are over 200,000 cataloged items. Uh, these include pulps and comics, uh, as well as books. Uh, and in this picture on the bottom right, uh, you can see um, first edition of one of Ray Bradbury's works, along with, in the very bottom left there, I know the picture's a little dark, but it's for, um, it was part of our 50th anniversary display. So um, on the bottom left is a copy of one of the, the pulps that we have in our collections. And moving around to the bottom left, uh, science fiction and fantasy have long been very strong uh, visual and material media genres. And the collection has a wide range of different material and visual items, uh, such as these Star Trek dolls uh, that, are, that are part of one of the fandom collections. Slide. All right, moving away from the world of science fiction and fantasy, I'm going to talk to you about the Water Resources Collection and Archives. Uh, WRCA is how we abbreviate it, because Water Resources Collections and Archives is quite a mouthful. Um, the WRCA has its origins at UC Berkeley in the late 1950s, where it began as a standalone research institute and library. The collection primarily documents the water infrastructure of California with an emphasis on the northern part of the state based on its origins at Berkeley. It includes materials farther afield, though, representing uh, regions of the entire American Southwest and the West Coast more broadly, as well as more uh, topical subjects such as dam removal or the impact of dams. Uh, tundra thawing, and many more. Uh, the WRCA is housed in several different locations uh, with the 280 archival collections uh, held in special collections. Uh, there is a substantial circulating component which is housed at the Orbach Science Library, and there are also a wide range of uh, reports and government publications in the do government docs section on the first floor of Rivera. So that's my part for now, and I'm going to hand it off to Andrea to talk about University Archives. Okay, um, just screen sharing here. Um, let me see if I can get to the right place. So um, yeah, so as Andrew said, um, I'm going to be talking about University Archives. Um, and University Archives is responsible for um, uh, collecting anything related to the history of UCR, uh, university records, and so forth. Um, and actually prior to uh, UCR becoming a university, it was um, a UC research station called the Citrus Experiment Station, which was founded in 1907. And you're looking at um, a photo of the Citrus Experiment Station um, from 1907, um, and that building is still housed on campus here at UCR. Um, and uh, then uh, UCR was established in 1954. Um, so here are a couple of photos um, of uh, students on campus in the 1950s. Um, and uh, we do actually know that University Archives was a part of, of UCR um, very early on because there's a video of the dedication ceremony of UCR, which took place on October 22nd, 1954. Um, and it actually mentions the University Archives in that um, 
in that video. So um, University Archives has been a part of uh, UCR um, from its inception. And I'll talk a little bit about what we collect in University Archives. So um, as I said, it's the designated repository for records, documents, publications, and other historic material pertaining to UCR. Um, so one of our main collecting areas is administrative records. Um, and these include the records of various academic departments, administrative units, um, like the chancellor's office. Uh, this is a photo of Tomas Rivera, who um, was chancellor of UCR from 1979 to 1984. And he was actually the first person of color to serve um, as chancellor in the entire UC system. So he's a really important figure in um, UCR history. Um, we also collect records of student life. Um, so these include papers, photos, and um, any kind of ephemera related to student life at UCR. Um, the yearbooks are a really great example of this. Um, so the photo on the upper right is from the 1969 UCR student yearbook, um, and it shows members of the Black Student Union um, from that time. We also collect faculty papers. Um, which are pretty much what they sound like, the papers and research materials from UCR faculty, and usually these relate to uh, the research area of uh, the individual faculty member. Um, and so this is a photo of the humanities faculty, uh, the original group of humanities faculty at UCR from 1954. And finally, we also collect the records of uh, various campus organizations. So um, since UCR is a pretty, um, Pretty good sized campus. We have a lot of different organizations affiliated with the university. Um, and these, you know, some of them are uh, run by professional staff and some of them are run by students or volunteers. Um, ASUCR is one example of uh, the campus organizations that we have records for. Um, and uh, the sort of little um, flyer on the right is from an event organized by ASUCR. Um, in 1969, which um, showed um, they had a screening for a, a film um, about Che Guevara, as you can see. Um, and so I just wanted to give a little mention to the various formats, since we can't meet in person. Um, I think it's interesting to um, discuss uh, kind of give you a sense of all of the different types of materials we have. Um, so uh, we collect a really broad range of materials, um, pretty much everything that you can think of from photos, um, audiovisual materials, and those include um, video, audio reel, um, and, um, and anything you can think of really, cassette tapes. Um, we have uh, newspapers, scrapbooks, yearbooks, uh, flyers, artifacts like these medals um, from an athletic event that took place on campus. And then we also have correspondence and really the list can go on and on. But I hope that gives you some sense of um, the variety of material that we have. And I also just wanted to mention um, our research guides in case you're looking for more information about our collections. We do have research guides which live on our website. Hopefully this will take me where I'm trying to go. Um, and so you should be looking at our website right now, um, which has the research guides. And this is a research guide specifically for university archives. So if you're looking for an introduction to the collections um, and more information, I think this is a really good starting point. And it covers um, basically all of the areas I touched on um, in a little bit more detail here. So if you're looking for information about the history of UCR, it lists the various collections that, um, that, that touch on that. Um, and then um, the same with um, information about campus. So we have collections of blueprints, photographs, um, and construction records and so forth. Um, so all of that information is co-located for you here. 
Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is um, our COVID-19 collection. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because we are actively seeking out material related to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, on the UCR community. So if you're a part of that community and you have any photos, journals, or anything that speaks to that experience, please feel free to get in touch. Um, since as Sandy said, we are living through a very unique moment in history. Um, and that's something that we want to make sure we are documenting in um, university archives. So there is more information about that on a on our website um, and I'll link to this um, in the chat. So yeah, if you have anything, feel free to get in touch with me. And with that, I will hand it over to our collections management librarian, Jessica Geiser. Okay, so I am going to talk a little bit more about our rare books, manuscripts, and archival collections. So basically all the other collecting areas and strengths we have that go into what we call special collections. Um, and that consists of around 100,000 rare books, manuscripts, and other print items, and over 2,500 linear feet of archival collections. Um, so one of the first major collecting areas in general special collections is on local history. And that includes the Riverside area, as well as the history of the Inland Empire. So we collect local publications like maps, directories, history books, and publications like the one on the left here. This is a Riverside Illustrated, um, and it advertised Riverside as a great place for economic development. Um, we also have archival collections with historic photographs and artifacts like the citrus labels pictured in the middle here. And finally, we also hold collections from locals that detail their experiences living in Riverside, um, which offer a personal and local perspective on historical events. So one example of this, which is pictured on the right here, is the Fujimoto family diaries, which are diaries that were kept by a local Japanese American father and son during World War II, and it details their experiences being removed to a Japanese incarceration camp in Arizona. Um, another strong collecting area that we have in special collections is the Rupert and Jeanette Costo papers, um, and that also includes the Costo Library of the American Indian. So Rupert and Jeanette Costo, who are pictured in the middle here, um, they were both Native scholars and activists who collected materials related to Native American history and culture. And in addition, they founded the American Indian Historical Society and the Indian Historian Press. So the Costo papers, which is their archival collection, it holds photographs, film, and documents on Native American cultures and histories. And it also includes a small collection of artifacts, including baskets, jewelry, and pottery made by different Native American tribes. So some of those baskets are pictured on the bottom left there. Um, the Costo Library of the American Indian contains the Library of the American Indian Historical Society. And it's pictured up on the top right there. It's a dedicated space on the fourth floor of Rivera where when the library opens again, anyone can browse through that library as well as study in that space. And most people say it's their favorite place to study in the library. Um, so in addition to the initial donation from the Costos, Special Collections is also dedicated to adding to the collection. And most recently, we've added a number of artist books produced by Native American authors. So the book on the bottom right there is an artist book called The Lost Journals of Sacagawea. So another collecting area that we have is the Tuskegee Airmen Archive, and that's of 22 archival collections related to the Tuskegee Airmen, who were the first black military aviators to serve in the U.S. Army Air Corps, um, and that began in 1941, and they paved the way for full integration of the U.S. Army. So the collections that we hold include personal papers from both airmen and nurses who served in the Tuskegee Army Airfield, and we also have artifacts, memorabilia, and other items like action figures and things from a Rose Parade float. There's a seed portrait you can see there um, that honor the service of the Tuskegee Airmen and their legacy. Um, Special Collections also holds multiple collections related to art, music, and dance. I have some images from just a few of our collections here. So the highlighted collections I've included here at the top left, there's a picture of Sadakichi Hartman, whose papers we have. And he was a poet and art critic who was a major part of the Bohemian art scene in the late 19th century. 
Um, we also have the Daystar Rosalie Jones papers. There's a photo of that in the middle there. Um, and that documents the first native modern dance company in the US. We have the Ted McCown collection of flamenco sound recordings. There's a picture of one of the reels there on the bottom left. And that collection contains recordings of Spanish flamenco musicians from the late 1960s. At the top right, we have a program from the Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean papers, which document um, their papers, they're two modern dance pioneers. And then on the bottom right, we have a piece of music from the Oswald Jonas Memorial Collection. And that collection has materials from music theorists and composers Oswald Jonas and Heinrich Schenker. So this is just a little sampling. We have a lot more as well. Um, other notable archival collections we have include the George E. Brown Jr. papers, which consist of materials related to Brown's over 30 year career as the congressman serving the Riverside and Inland Empire area. And so there's many materials in that collection related not only to public policy and the US legislative process, but also local and national historic events from the mid to late 20th century. We also have a number of photograph collections related to the Mexican Revolution, which took place from around 1910 to 1920. And there's two pictures in the middle there from that. Um, we have photographs of generals, battles, Zapatistas, and major figures from that conflict, like Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. Some other collections we have are related to Latin America. So we have research on and primary materials from countries like Paraguay, Uruguay, and Panama, in addition to other aspects of Mexican history. So the collection that I have a sample from here is from Mexico, and it consists of posters produced by the Mexican government in the 1980s that highlight various indigenous languages spoken in Mexico in addition to local folk tales and traditions. Um, we also hold archival collections and a book collection related to author B. Traven, whose works include The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. So Traven's real identity was widely disputed throughout his lifetime, and even today is not fully confirmed. So many of our archival collections focus on various researchers' efforts to figure out who B. Traven actually was. And we also hold a large collection of Traven's works in our rare book collection. And then moving on to our rare books, some of our collecting efforts there include a large collection of Cordell's. Um, and Cordell's were popular and cheaply made booklets and pamphlets meant for mass consumption, produced mostly in Brazil, and they contained folk novels, poems, and songs. Um, we also hold a large collection of early print books on a variety of subjects. Um, the book that I have pictured here um, is on culinary poisons from 1820, um, although we have works that are much older than that as well. And then we also have a small collection of works about photography and photographic techniques from the 19th and 20th centuries. So the book pictured on the right there, Le Magazine Pittoresque, contains a chapter on daguerreotypes that was published in 1939. And that was the year that that photographic process, which was the first publicly available type of photograph, was made public. So that came out right when daguerreotypes came out. Um, in addition to our older print books, we also have a large collection of leaves, and a leaf is just an individual page from a book. Um, and we have manuscript and print leaves. So our manuscript leaves, and manuscripts means it was done entirely by hand. Um, we have manuscript leaves from religious works like the Book of Hours, as well as pages from antiphonaries, like the one pictured on the left here. And that had notations for chants used in church services. And then we also have a collection of manuscript leaves in Arabic, Farsi, and Coptic, which includes from the Quran and other religious and secular works. So the leaves on the left and the right hand side here, those were done entirely by hand. Um, we do also have a collection of leaves from early print books. So the one in the middle was using early print techniques and our leaves are from the 15th to the 17th century. And then finally, some of the other interesting collections in our rare book holdings are our collections of artist books, which are small or fine press printings of books, which are really works of art themselves. And they can vary greatly in terms of format, size, and content. I have just two examples here. Um, the book at the top there on the left is an artist book, a handmade book and case that contains poetry from Emily Dickinson. And then the work on the bottom is called Bay Bridges in a Nutshell, and it's an accordion style piece with information on various bridges in the San Francisco Bay Area 
And if you look in the back there, you can see it's housed actually in a nutshell. Um, another collection that we have is miniature books. And those are books that are, have dimensions of under around three inches or so. Um, they come on any number of subjects. And sometimes they were miniature so they could fit in your pocket. And sometimes they're miniature to be a work of art or a collector's piece. And the book that's pictured here is The Lord's Prayer. And it's the smallest book in our collection. And it actually, The Lord's Prayer is printed very small inside of that book. So you can read it if you probably had a magnifying glass. Um, our other noteworthy collection in our rare book holdings is our pamphlet collection. Um, and that consists mostly of pamphlets and brochures that are related to labor rights and workers unions in the 20th century. So these were items that could be easily published and masters to pass out and spread the word about workers' rights to people. So that was just a very, very brief overview of some of our collecting areas in special collections, but it's by no means an exhaustive list of everything we have. So I would encourage anybody who's doing research or interested in a topic to just search special collections because we might have a rare or primary source material related to that topic. And so to talk about how you would do that, I'm going to now pass it back to Sandy to talk about accessing our materials. Awesome, thank you. So, get my screen back up. Okay, so yes. Thank you, Jessica, and that's exactly it. Now that you have learned about all our awesome collections here and you're like, okay, what do I have to do? What's the next step? I wanna see these things. Um, well, there's three main portals online that you can utilize to navigate our collections. The first one is the one, ooh, there we go, that you might be pretty familiar with if you've ever used any of the UCR libraries before, and that's just our general library catalog. That will search all of the different collections that we have, so it's a great one-stop shop if you're just trying to browse and get a feel for what's there. However, if you knew that you wanted to look at digital collections specifically, so things that have been digitized or um, you know, born digital materials, then you would use the web portal that's called Calisphere. And same thing with here, if you knew that you were interested in physical collections and that you, you know, were gonna request that materials be scanned for your research, then you would use the Online Archive of California. Both of these two, Calisphere and OAC, Online Archive of California, are great because they don't just look through UCR's collections, they actually look through an entire network of collections across California. So that's gonna include other institutions in the UC system, as well as other libraries, museums, historical societies, et cetera. So we'll briefly go through each of the web portals so you can get an idea of how their search functions differ and what they look like. But I definitely recommend that if you're just starting off, you can start with the UCR library catalog. Okay, so you're familiar with the website, you just go to library.ucr.edu. And we'll go ahead and type in something fun to search. Uh, we'll start with Star Trek, which as you recall from our Eaton collection is actually a very um, represented kind of topic in our collections. And so right off the bat, you'll see some different squares here. And you'll notice one of them looks familiar. It's Calisphere. So all of these sites are relatively interconnected. And you can kind of jump from one to the other using links like this. But here you can already see a preview of any digital materials that pertain to Star, uh, Star Trek from that website. But in our case, we're just going to look at our regular old UCR catalog. And as you can tell, there's a lot of results. We already have 1,300 here. So we're gonna narrow it down specifically to Special Collections University Archives. And the way that you would do that is going to the left-hand side of the screen for the filters and selecting Library. And from there, you can select Special Collections, Apply Filter, and then you'll know exactly um, where in the library you're looking at. And you can tell if it's now it'll pop up here under the Available At. So let's say that you were interested in um, this particular item. You would click on it to open its record. And you'll see down here that there is a call number for it. So the same way that there's a call number when you're looking for a specific book, um, all, all our materials also have unique identifiers like that. And in this case, if this is the item that you wanna see, you're gonna wanna go ahead and copy that to have it ready to go. You'll take a look at the different editions or the years. And once you know exactly what you want, you would click on this link, 
that will take you to the special collections request form. And my colleague Karen will talk a little bit more about what this form is and how you would use it. But just to give you a sneak peek, that's how you would get to it. So let's say that um, you, know, you wanted to look at digital materials specifically, then you would go to calisphere.org and we can do the same thing, just type in Star Trek and we'll already get all our results here on the side. We'll still have some filters. So if you wanted to narrow down by the type of material, maybe the you know, decade it was made or even the institution that's holding it, because like I mentioned, you have hundreds of institutions contributing items to this website. You can do that right here. So let's go ahead and narrow it down to UCR Special Collections. And you'll see some of the photos here from our Klein collection of photographs. And so um, Klein was a photographer that kind of specialized in the early sci-fi conventions. So if you're familiar with Comic-Con, you know, these are kind of like the predecessors to that and what it looked like um, at the very beginning of the fandom culture. So from here, you can just click on any item that you're interested in and you'll be able to get its citation info using this little button here. So whether you're using APA or MLA or some other kind of um, format, this is all the main metadata that you're gonna wanna have to include in that citation. You can also have the option to download the image. So it will tell you a little um, information about you know, copyright concerns here. And if you wanted to get a higher resolution image, you would need to contact us for that but you're able to download it and input it into your research from there. And if you scroll down, you can see some more information about this item, such as the collection it came from, other copyright concerns. If you're publishing this in a book, then it's something that you're definitely gonna to wanna to pay attention to. But if you're using this for like a coursework or like a paper for your class, then you're able to um, include it, just make sure that you add the citation as is. And lastly, if you were interested in the physical collections, um, you would use the Online Archive of California. And here it's gonna be very different. So we're now we're not really looking at the item level, we're looking at a whole collection of, um, you know, of, from the archives. And so what you'll see is all the information that the archivist has put together about this particular collection. So this is a guide that they've created to help you navigate the collection because some of them can be quite large. This one is 18 boxes, so it's a lot of uh, you know, information to sift through. But you can use this guide to narrow down to what box or maybe even what folder is most useful for, for you in your research. So from here, we can get a description of what this collection is about, some background about it, again, the copyright restrictions, anything that you should be aware of if you're planning to commercially publish this work. And you can also look here at the actual contents of the boxes in this collection. So let's say that we were interested in, you know, seeing maybe this image. We see that there's a film cell with Captain Kirk sitting and Commander Spock to his right. If we wanted to get a digitized copy of that, we would wanna make sure we note this is box 16 and it's item one. And that's to make sure that our staff on site are able to like, find the exact item that you're interested in having digitized. So you would just make a note of that and then you would click on the request items button here. And it's gonna look familiar to, yeah, as the same one, it'll take you to the same form that the UCR catalog website took you to. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to my colleague, Karen, to um, kind of start talking about what goes on after this form. Okay, thank you, Sandy. So there are usually two ways that I can help you with your research. The first way is if you actually come in person to our reading room to access our materials on site. Unfortunately, the reading room, the library, and the rest of campus are currently closed. So the other way I can help you is getting reproductions. That's just digital scans of our collections materials. So we use a system called Aon, and it's just a special collections request system. So I'm gonna spend my portion of the presentation talking about creating an account and walking you through the process of submitting a request. So this is a simple overview of the process. So first, you do need to create a free account through Aon, and then you need to submit a reproduction order. You will have to pay if payment is necessary, and I'll talk a little bit about payment in just a moment. 
And then once I do scan and deliver the items, you want to make sure that you download that item to your computer because it will automatically delete from our server within 30 days. So we're going to walk through the process of creating an account and submitting a request. So this is a screen you've seen a few times from Sandy. So you want to go to aon.library.ucr.edu to create that free screen. You want to make sure that you sign up as a UCR affiliate. An affiliate is just a student, staff member, or faculty member from UCR or any of the UC campuses. You want to make sure you select that because when we do charge you, you actually get charged less money than somebody who is not an affiliate. So once you click on that, you will have to sign in with your NetID, your password, and then you'll have to do the second authentication, so either a push or a passcode. So you'll accept the terms and conditions. These are just standard rules that any special collections in university archives will have. Once you do that, you're actually going to create your account. And about halfway through the screen, you're going to see, are you currently affiliated with University of California? And you want to make sure that you select yes. And then you can create your own username and password. Just make sure what those are. Once you submit the information, your account will go live almost immediately. So there's very little lag time, so you can start submitting reproduction orders. And this is what your account page will look like. And you can see the menu bar on the left-hand side about the third entry down is new request. And there are two options in that category. One is simply request, and that's if you intend to come into the reading room to look in person at these items. Again, we can't currently offer that. So you're going to want to select reproduction order. When you click on reproduction order, this screen is going to pop up. So you need to make sure you give us anything with a red asterisk. Anything extra is nice. It might help us pull the item, but we definitely need something with a red asterisk filled in. So at the very bottom, you're gonna go ahead and submit request, and that's when it actually comes to me. I'll print out the request. I'll go pull the item. I'll do a page count, and then I'll scan and deliver the items to you. So very simple process, but there's a lot of wonderful materials to access, so I encourage you to definitely do these reproduction orders, especially now that we're offering a new service that I want to talk about. It's called on-demand scanning, and this is specifically and exclusively for UCR affiliates. So students, staff, and faculty at any of the UC systems can partake in this service. We are offering 200 free pages of scanning per person per month. Usually we do charge, and this is temporary, so we will likely go back to charging once the campus does open. So again, you want to take advantage of this now. And if your request goes beyond the 200 page limit, then we will set up an appointment with one of our librarians who has expertise in your particular research area and they can help you hone your request. You don't have to do anything special when you're doing on-demand scanning. You just submit the reproduction order the same way I showed you. And I'm the one who checks to make sure you're the UCR affiliate and then you will not be charged. So again, I'm happy to help with this process um, and definitely take advantage of it while you can. So I'm going to turn it back on over to Sandy. All right. So, okay, so I just kind of wanted to wrap up by looking at some of our upcoming events. So this is just one of the events that we have planned for this quarter. But our next one is going to be on October 14th, and it's going to be looking at the cultural and historical context of face masks. So that's going to be a pretty exciting facilitated conversation. We definitely invite you to come join us for that. After that, um, my colleague Andrew, who you met earlier, our processing archivist, and I are going to be doing a talk about some of the more interesting fandom materials in our collections, which is our Slash fan fiction and our Yaoi manga. So if you're not familiar with Slash or Yaoi or Boys Love manga, um, these are examples of queer fandom materials. They're typically written by women for women but they depict um, homosexual relationships between male characters, fictional male characters. So these are really interesting materials and we're very excited to share them with the community. And so we invite you to join us for that event on November 5th. And we're also offering this new drop-in weekly hour um, throughout this, one, this fall quarter. So from October 7th to December 9th, every week on Wednesdays for one hour, we're going to be available through Zoom, just like we are today. Um, for any drop-in questions, concerns, or other comments. Um, so feel free to look into that and join us for that. And then for winter and spring, we have some exciting events also planned. To give you a sneak peek, we're going to be doing a presentation about archival research geared towards doing archival research during a pandemic, as well as using zines for, mo for remote research and an introduction to indigenous digital resources. 
So that's very exciting. And I'll drop this link in the chat later, but you can view more information about all of these events on this link below and also register for them at library.ucr.edu slash about slash SCIWA events. Okay, so we're on to the third portion of our presentation today. And this is the very fun part. This is where we each kind of have picked some different items that we are particularly you know, excited about to share with you from the collections. And I'm actually up first, and I picked the Avery E. Fields Photographs Collection, which is also um, MS-146. And that's because when I first started at UCR, I moved to downtown Riverside. I had moved in from New York. So I was actually, you know, I lived really close to a lot of these sites. And you might recognize them if you're also from Riverside or have been there for a while. So this is the bell from Mount Rubidoux. Here we have the public library, which is still kind of similar to the structure. And these are the arches near the Mission Inn. So for me, uh, it was just really exciting to see like places that I've like walked by, you know, during the arts walk every month or just that I have come across in my own like daily life in the archives. And of course it makes sense because Avery Fields was a very like recognized photographer who was known for documenting um, Riverside during the 20th century, particularly the Mission Inn. But that's just always like a fun thing to know, to see your own community and your own local life reflected in the archives. So the first item I picked, um, because I usually get questions about what's the oldest item that you have in special collections in university archives. And this is it. It's a relatively new acquisition, I would say, in maybe in the last six to eight months we purchased it. And it's uh, made of vellum, which is animal skin, and it's written in Latin, and it dates to between 825 and 850, so the middle part of the ninth century. So this is something, once the reading room does open up, that you will be able to come in and look at in person. So the next item I chose is completely different. It's probably my favorite book cover ever. So somebody took the time to translate Shakespeare's Hamlet into Klingon, which is the language that um, Gene Roddenberry created for the Star Trek TV series. And this one was my pick. This is the Jose Antonio Ua collection of Carte de Visite. And it's just an album of Carte de Visite was an old photographic process um, where they would print out portraits on these little cards and it used to be you could take portraits of yourself and pass them out to people or in this case it's almost like old baseball cards almost um, because Ua collected these cartes de visite and they were of different royals and military generals from Europe and South America and Mexico and this album dates back to like the mid 19th century so mid 1800s and I just really like this collection because it's interesting to see what he collected and also he hand wrote, you can see on the bottom left there, the labels for everybody. Um, so it's interesting to see what he called people and the cards he collected and just to think about sort of popular culture during this time and who was famous, especially having military generals in there. That's not something we really see these days of collecting baseball cards basically of your favorite royals and generals. So. To me, it's just really interesting and to see the old photographs is, is really interesting as well. So I just think this is a fun collection. All right, so this collection is from the WRCA, the water collection. Uh, and this is kind of a neat one. So uh, Blake Gumprecht was an, a researcher and author who uh, wrote a book on the history of the Los Angeles River. Uh, and so there's there's a ton of information there going all the way back to you know like a century old or even before that uh, but this was a really neat little find um, there were some pictures from the filming of Greece uh, which you can see on the bottom left there uh, in the canals in downtown LA uh, and so that's a, a great little shot from the set um, and then it's juxtaposed there with um, a more current photograph of the Sixth Street Bridge uh, in downtown in the canals. Slide. All right, and this is this is one of my favorite things uh, in the collections. Um, so this is from the Catherine Clark papers, which is part of the Eaton collection, and she engaged in a pen pal program uh, towards the end of the Cold War in the late eighteen uh, late nineteen eighties, 
um, and she exchanged correspondence with a uh, Soviet citizen, Igor Tolokonikov, for three or four years. Uh, and they, he ended up being, it was just sort of happenstance, he was a science fiction fan um, in Russia, um, and he tried to set up a, a convention. And they, they in, in his letters, he talks a lot about just Soviet life in, you know, towards the end of the, of the USSR regime. Uh, and in this this specific uh, letter, he he tells her about uh, being, you know, working the convention uh, at the same time that the coup attempt in 1991 happens in Moscow. And uh, you can see so this in in the that's highlighted section here towards the end, he talks about taking a chip off the block of the statue of um, Felix Terzinski. Uh, and this is a picture from when they pulled the statue down uh, during the, the coup attempt. Um, and he was the head of the Soviet secret police. And so it's just this really interesting, you know, you, you don't necessarily always expect to find these, you know, uh, current historical events uh, when you're just, you know, popping open a collection and going through it the first time. But that was a, a pretty fun surprise to find something like that. Okay, I'm up next. So um, I actually chose two items. The first one is actually a, um, a film that I recently discovered in our collections and it's from um, 1968. Um, this was actually a promotional film um, that was produced by um, the public relations office at UCR. And they chose to follow um, a freshman named Richard Smith around during his first year um, at UCR. So, um, so what we're looking at here is uh, a still from the, the, um, the video. And um, it's actually a pretty high profile production for the time. They spent $11,000, um, which was a lot of money in 1968. Um, and um, I'm going to play the first couple of minutes, just the introduction to the film, um, because it's kind of um, fun to watch. And you might recognize the voice of the narrator. Um, it's uh, Ray, Raymond Burr, who played Perry Mason in during the 50s um, and the original Perry Mason um, TV show. So I'll play it and hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties here. Uh, so here we go. Pattern of life. Oops. This is a story of change. Classes seem to last for hours. And in junior high, the days are long and slow. The tempo picks up in high school with sports and driving and dating. But it's not until the first year of college that the pace of life hits its frenzied peak. It's in that freshman year that a boy starts to become a man. Every student and every campus is different, yet they're enough alike so that what happens to one freshman at one university can show some of what's happening on today's campus, can provide an important look during a time when the public's view of the university is often as confused as the first impressions of a new freshman. This is the story of student Richard Bain Smith, a regent scholar from San Diego, but it's also the story of every college freshman. It was filmed at the University of California, Riverside, where communication between students, faculty, and administration are uncommonly good. But it's also the story of changes taking place at every college. It's a study of the pressures that affect the university and how it responds to them. It's about the relationship between faculty and students, the use of beer and barbiturates, the loneliness, the search for a new pattern of life. This is a story of change, change on campus, 
change in the individual. It's a look at a demanding full-time job, the occupation of student. Well, first day. So um, hopefully everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. This is one of my favorite things. Um, not only because it was a serendipitous discovery, but also just because I think it really is such a time capsule um, uh, for that particular time period. And if you do have time to watch it, um, it's available on YouTube. Um, it's about uh, half an hour and um, they cover all of the various political issues that were unfolding in the late 1960s. Um, which is, of course, a really tumultuous and interesting time. So um, I, I just really enjoy this and um, wanted to share that with all of you. And then there's one more thing. This is the very th last thing that we'll look at today, um, which is uh, the commencement address that was given by Joan Didion at UCR in 1975. Um, and I'm assuming we're all familiar with Joan Didion, but just in case we're not, she's a writer um, and she's best known for her um, essays and memoirs. Um, and she gave the commencement address at UCR in 1975, as I said, and it's um, something that's uh, considered one of the best commencement speeches of all time. If you sort of um, start doing some research on the internet, looking at the top 10 best commencement speeches of all time, you'll definitely see this one is cited um, multiple places. Um, however, you will not find the full text transcript of the speech because it has never been published. Um, so uh, this is something that we've actually had requests for in the past, and for a long time we weren't sure if we had it or able to find it, but last fall we actually did find a copy um, of the transcript which was published in um, the UCR Alumni Association newsletter um, shortly after she gave the address. Um, so um, I do have an excerpt that I'll read, and I, I chose this also because um, I wanted to end on a note of optimism, um, since this is such a, a unique time that we're all living through right now. I do think that this conveys um, sort of a message of hope in Joan Didion's unique voice, so I'll just read a quick paragraph. Um, and this is towards the end of the speech. She says, I'm not telling you to make the world better because I don't think that progress is necessarily part of the package. I'm just telling you to live in it, not just to endure it, not just to suffer it, not just to pass through it, but to live in it, to look at it, to try to get the picture, to live recklessly, to take chances, to make your own work and take pride in it, to seize the moment. So um, that's the note that I wanted to end on um, with all of this. And um, if you're interested in um, reading the full text of the transcript, you can request that using the process that we've talked about today. Um, and with that, um, I will pass it back to Sandy. Great. Thank you, Andrea. I loved that video and that speech. That was awesome. Um, so that kind of concludes our presentation today, but we would like to um, share with you a quick link to a small survey. This, so you can tell us how you, you know, how you enjoyed this event or if there's anything that we can do to improve. We would really appreciate that feedback. So I'll make sure to drop that link in the chat as well. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and if you do happen to think of any more questions after today's presentation, you can always reach us at our email. I'll go ahead and set that in here, specialcollections at ucr.edu, or join us for one of those Ask the Archives drop-in hours in the future. Thank you all very much for coming. We really had a good time putting this together, and the staff has, has done a really good job, and we really, really appreciate it. Have a good day, everybody. See you at the next one. Bye. Bye.